Sometimes when we come before the Bible, we can find ourselves in a place of pretty deep despair and condemnation. How, how do we deal with that? Well, John talks about that here in 1 John chapter 3. Open with us, follow along, find out. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you mind standing with me and taking out your Bibles? If you don't have a Bible this morning, you can raise your hand and one of our ushers will bring you one. We are in the book of 1 John in the New Testament. We're moving at like a really fast pace through this book. Uh, 1 John is near the end of your Bible, so open to the very last book, Revelation, and then turn just a little bit to the left and you'll find 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 1st John chapter 3 is where we're at. 1st John 3, we'll pick it up today at verse 18. There the apostle writes, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God and whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. And this is the commandment, that we should believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. Now, he who keeps His commandments abides in Him, and He in Him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. Father, we pray, I pray that you would give us wisdom by your Spirit as we consider this text this morning. God, we trust that your word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, that it is inspired and useful for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, so that we would be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And the scriptures remind us that you have prepared good works for us that we should walk in them. So I pray, God, that the good works that you have prepared for each and every individual standing here this morning, that you would further equip us for those things by the working of your word and by the power of your spirit. We ask this today in Jesus' name. And all those that agreed said, amen. amen. You may be seated. If you have actually been following along with what John is saying here in this letter in 1 John and, and what we have been looking at as I've been preaching through this letter thus far, if you've been following along and you are not a little concerned about your own spiritual condition, your own salvation, then you may not actually be paying attention. And as my Wonderful dad says, if you're paying anything, pay attention. <laughs> it's important for us to consider what the scriptures say, but it is a reality that as we consider what the scriptures say, there are certain things that the scriptures have to say that can be very challenging and convicting for us. And that is really clear when you look at what John says here in this section in 1 John. John's core point, as we have been looking at this text, is that there are two distinct groups of people in the world. As inspired by the Spirit of God, John says there's really only two groups of people. He says there are the children of God, and then there are the children of the devil. It's a very stark contrast. And then he describes how we can identify the children of God versus the children of the devil. He says the children of God... They do righteousness. They practice righteousness. And then he describes what exactly he means by practice of righteousness. And he says that the ultimate demonstration of the practice of righteousness is to walk in love, to love one another, a, a certain kind of love, a self-sacrificial love, which he has been describing here in this passage. If you look at verse 16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So it is a self-sacrificial love. That is the manifestation in the life of a person who is practicing righteousness. And this, he says, is demonstration of what a child of God is. Then he says the children of the devil, they do not practice righteousness and they lack this righteous characteristic of love. Instead, in place of that love, that self-sacrificial love is hatred, which at times can be manifested as murder. And he uses the story of an Old Testament character named Cain, one of the earliest characters of the Bible, one of the first human beings really, to show this manifestation of hatred 
in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 4. That's the first book of the Bible. And so John's point is so very clear. If you do not practice righteousness as demonstrated through sacrificial love, then you are not a child of God. You are a child of the devil. It doesn't matter what you say about yourself, your personal proclamation. It's what your life, the demonstration of your life, says about you that is more important. Now, with that kind of clarity, it's hard not to be at least a little bit rattled, to be challenged by what the text says. One Bible commentator on this passage, John Stott, he said, the Christian's serene assurance may be disturbed by this text. I think that's an understatement. The Christian's serene assurance may be disturbed by this text. Certainly, that's the case when you really see what John is saying in this passage. And that feeling of disturbance, Stott says, may not be unusual or infrequent because a couple English translations of this Bible, when it says in verse 20, if our heart condemns us, that's I'm reading from the New King James Version, there's some other English translations that say, whenever our heart condemns us. And so maybe this feeling of condemnation, this feeling of conviction, this rattling, if you will, is not unusual or infrequent. Now, as a side note, if you find yourself unsettled and disturbed when you come to the Scriptures and you read the Bible, you're actually doing it the right way. If when you come to the Scriptures, there is something of a heaviness because of the conviction that comes from the Scriptures, that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. If when you come to the Bible, you just find a whole bunch of things that your spouse needs to fix, you're not reading it correctly. The Bible is filled with convicting words, and it should be to us more of a mirror by which we see ourselves than a lens through which we see others. But we can fall into the danger, the temptation, really, of only hearing the Bible taught or reading the Scriptures ourselves as something that other people need to do. You know, you hear a, a convicting Bible message and you go, you know, so-and-so really needs to hear this. I'm going to send them a link to the YouTube video. God wants to speak to us directly. One of the earliest writings of the New Testament is the book of James. And in the book of James, the apostle James tells us very clearly that we come to the scriptures as a mirror to show us who we are so that we not, might not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word also. So we can be very challenged when we come to the Bible. God's word will rattle you. As the book of Hebrews says, it is like a sharp two-edged sword, and it divides between joint and marrow, soul and spirit. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It reveals the true condition of our heart, and sometimes it can be frightening to see the true condition of our hearts. And so it can bring us to a place where we might even question whether or not we are the children of God. We might question our salvation. Now, that's not to say that the Christian won't have assurance of salvation. I think that we can and should have assurance of our position, our place with God. And that's really what John is driving home in this text. His hope is that we would be assured of our place with God. But I think for us to really have that assurance of our right place with God, we need to, need to do the very thing that the Apostle Peter prescribes, that he exhorts in one of his letters, first, or 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, he says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. We need to actually exert some effort, some diligence to making our position with God sure to us that we would be absolutely certain of our position with God. Now, how do we do that? That's the obvious question when you read Peter's words in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. How do we make our call and election sure? Now, certainly, Peter, in that passage in 2 Peter 1, he prescribes a certain grouping of steps, things that we ought to do as followers of Jesus to do that. But John does basically the same thing right here. 1 John chapter 3, we read it just a few minutes ago, verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this, we know that we are of the truth, and we shall assure our hearts before him. Point number one, love displayed Indeed, and truth assures me of my standing before God. This is essentially important, and this is what John has been driving home in this text. 
that when we see love displayed, demonstrated in our lives, not just in word, it's easy to mouth the words of love, quite a bit different to walk that out in deed and in truth, but when we see that displayed in our own lives, then it assures us of our standing with God. Now, why is this true? I think that there are two possible ways to answer the question of why this point is true. One is maybe the religious way. And when I say the religious way, the religious answer would say that I earn my good standing with God by my good works. And there are maybe many of you who you lived your life for a certain period of time thinking that if I just did A, B, C, X, Y, Z, if I did these things the right way, and they they may have even been good Bible things that you said, if I did these things, then I will earn my right standing with God. That is the religious approach to these things. Now, this religious approach, I believe, is problematic for at least three reasons, three reasons being this. First, it's problematic because it bolsters pride. That religious approach bolsters pride because we have this certain set of rules or ordinances that if I just keep these rules and ordinances to some standard, then I will have a right standing with God. And and how do we judge whether or not we're keeping these rules and ordinances in the right standard? We look at other people and we try to find other people who don't keep them as good as us. And we are really good at kind of picking out like, well, I'm doing way better than that guy, and I'm doing a lot better than that guy. And occasionally we might seem like, well, you know, I could do a little bit better because that person's doing better. But, but you know, forget about that. I'm way better than all these other people. And so that re- religious formulation, if you will, it, it really bolsters our pride, at least as it relates to interacting with other people. But not only does it, it bolster pride, but it destroys peace. At an internal level. Yeah, on the outside, we can, we can put up a show. We can make it seem like we're doing pretty good, doing better than the next guy. But when we are alone in any form of contemplation, we find ourselves distressed. There is no peace in that place of religion. We're never at rest because we always have to do more to try and catch up, to get to this level, which when we are in that place of private time, we realize we're just not there yet. I think this is part of the reason why we live in a culture that so wants to distract itself with the constant drone of things going on so that we never have to wrestle with the internal struggle that is there, that I'm just not, I'm not living up to the standard that I ought to be. And so the person that wants to live in this way before God religiously, this bolsters pride, it destroys peace, and as a result, there is no third, there is no fullness of joy. Now, our, our series through John has been called Fullness of Joy because of what John writes in 1 John chapter 1, verse 4. I write these things so that your joy may be full. But then he writes this series of things that puts us in kind of a distressing place. And, and living religiously, after a, a series of rules and pattern of laws to try and make ourselves right before God, we will never have that fullness of joy. So the religious answer is, I believe, the wrong approach to this question of why love displayed in deed and truth assures me of my standing before God. It's not because of our religious efforts. What's the right way? Well, I think the right way is the the scriptural answer that John has been giving us here in this text. It's given to us in in a few different places. 1 John 3, verse 10, we looked at this a few weeks ago. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. He hits the point again in verse 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. And then again in the text we read a few minutes ago in verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. So John's point is clear. Point number two, the genetic marker of sacrificial love is the proof that I am God's child. That when God makes us his children according to his love by grace through faith, he transforms us from the inside, and it begins to go on through our entire being, and we begin to see the genetic marker of sacrificial love, and that begins to be a proof to us, his spirit bearing witness with our spirit, that we are indeed the children of God. We begin to see a transformation that is a God-wrought transformation, and that is proof to us that God has changed us. 
The Apostle Paul says it like this in his letter to the Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love. The evidence that God's Spirit is in me or in you is love. And here's the amazing thing about the fruit of the Spirit that is love in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. What does it produce? The very thing that religion cannot produce. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and it produces joy and peace and patience, and kindness, and self-control. These things that religion cannot produce in us, the love of God at work in us produces in us. I, I cannot emphasize this point enough. We do not earn our position with God by our devotion, by our love. He has given us our position as his children by his love. We saw this at the beginning of 1 John chapter 3. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. That you are God's child today is according to His great love and not my devotion, not my sacrifice to try and earn that position. He has made me His child according to His love. Behold, what manner of love. Well, what manner of love is it? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. And then 1 John 3, 16, by this we know love because He laid down His life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, all this to bring us to the focus of our text today. John has created this extreme, stark contrast, this dichotomy between the children of God and the children of the devil. The children of God, they walk in righteousness as supremely evidenced by sacrificial love in their lives, which is a product of the Spirit of God working through them. Whereas the children of the devil, they do not practice righteousness and they do not have this love. Instead, they might have hate, which sometimes is manifested as murder. And in light of these stark contrasts, we can find ourselves more than a little disturbed in our hearts and in our minds because the fact is, as we look at ourselves in light of the scriptures, there are times where we question whether or not we have this love in us. And so we're put in a place of going, well, I think I'm a child of God. I believe I'm a child of God, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure when I sometimes look at where I'm at, and so we can find ourselves struggling. We read these words, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And you say, well, I'm trying to do this. And by this, we know that we are of the truth and we assure our hearts. And, and yet there are times where our, our hearts do not feel all that assured. Times where we actually kind of wonder and are more than a little concerned. You don't have to raise your hand, but have you ever wondered, am, am I really displaying the love of God in my life? Am I really a child of God? And we begin to feel internal condemnation. The questions abound in our own hearts and our minds. Where am I with God? And this comes oftentimes when we find that we do not live up to the standard that the Scriptures give to us. When we find ourselves irritable or angry and someone in our home or someone in our office building or on the construction site or at the school campus or maybe on the 15 freeway does something that triggers us and now all of a sudden we see something come out we go, where did that come from? And we realize, well, I know where it came from. My heart. Out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts and evil actions. And Jesus made it very clear in Mark chapter 7. And so we find ourselves in a place of conviction and maybe even condemnation. And so John says in 1 John 3, 20, for if our heart condemns us, yeah, that's me from time to time. If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. There is a good chance that as you walk with the Lord and you seek to live out the life of Christ from the Scriptures, as revealed in the Scriptures, that you will find yourself in a place where your heart condemns you just as mine does me. But, point number three, God's proclamation that I am His child supersedes the condemnation of my heart. John says, God is greater than our heart. Our heart that can condemn us and does condemn us. And when we, when we look at that word condemn, it means with damnation. That there is a way in which our heart damns us when we see ourselves in light of what the Scripture calls us to. 
But he says, God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. Now, I think the best demonstration of this reality is found in an exchange between the Apostle Peter and Jesus found at the end of the Gospel of John in the very last chapter of John. You're in 1 John. Would you turn to the left in your Bibles? About two-thirds of the way through the Bible are the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John chapter 21, the last chapter. Now, as you're turning there, a little bit of context will be helpful. Peter and Jesus are having a conversation here in John chapter 21 as they're sitting by the Sea of Galilee having a, a breakfast meal together. But the events that preceded this conversation are important because Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection precede this, but just before that, there was a conversation with Jesus and his disciples in which he said, listen, all of you are going to be made to stumble because of me tonight. And they all speak up and they're all proclaiming with their, their mouths, they're proclaiming their devotion. And Peter jumps to the forefront. He says, Lord, though all others stumble, I would never stumble. I would die with you. And so said all the disciples. They're like, yeah, yeah, we're with Peter. We would die with you too. And Jesus says to Peter, it's recorded in the Gospels, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before morning comes, before the rooster crows. I would never deny you. I would die with you. Well, if you've read through the Gospels, you know the story. The spirit was willing, the flesh was weak. Peter, before the sun came up the next day, denied Jesus, even cursing. I do not know the man. Swearing, I do not know the man. He denied the Lord. And the scriptures say that after he did, the rooster crowed, and he realized this, and he went and he wept bitterly. Now this is the restoration of Peter by Jesus. Do you think that maybe in that moment, after Peter had denied the Lord three times and gone and wept bitterly, do you think that maybe his heart condemned him? Do you think that maybe he questioned his devotion to the Lord? He swore, I would die with you, and then he denied three times. So his heart is certainly condemning him. His level of devotion, he's questioning whether or not he is even really a true, genuine follower of Jesus. But Jesus reaches out to him and now has this conversation with Peter. Verse 15, John 21. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? There's discussion among commentators about what is meant by more than these. Perhaps Jesus is saying, do you love me more than these other guys who are here? I want to suggest that Peter probably had a really hard time with that question. Do you love me more than these? Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. Jesus responded, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. Would you underline those words in your Bible? The same words we find in 1 John chapter 3. God is greater than our heart because he knows all things. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now, the full picture of this passage is not entirely clear in English. This is one of the rare occasions in the Bible where our English translations fall far short of the original. You can trust your English translations. The, the translators do a great job, but there are certain places where the original language in which this was written, the Greek language, is so much more helpful because in our language, we have a deficiency where the word love is concerned because we say things like, I love tacos, and I love my car, and I love my wife, but I hope that my love for my wife is far better than love for tacos. Amen? <laughs> So we recognize there's a deficiency where love is concerned in our language. But in the, English, in the Greek language, there are at least four words for love in classical Greek, Koine Greek. C.S. Lewis's book, The Four Loves, is really good on this. When Jesus says to Peter the first time, Peter, do you love me? He uses a Greek word, agapao, a verb 
that expresses a deep devotional, sacrificial love. It's most beautifully defined by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where he says, love is patient, love is kind, all those words there that are often spoken at many weddings. That is the Greek word agapao. And so he says to this former denier, this one who said, I would die with you, pledging his devotion. Now he says, hey, Peter, do you love me with a self-sacrificial devotion? And Peter responds to him, Lord, I phileo you, which is a Greek word, which is a great form of love. It's brotherly love. It's affection. But he could not come up to the level that Jesus asked. Peter, do you agapao me? Lord, you know that I phileo you. Peter is even questioning his devotion to the Lord at this moment. And I'm so grateful that even in light of the, the lessening degree to which Peter says, I do love you, Jesus still says to him, feed my sheep. So a second time, Jesus says to him, Peter, do you agapao me? And he says, Lord, you know that I phileo you. Tend my lambs. A third time. I can only imagine that Peter, he remembered it was three times that he denied the Lord. And now a third time, Jesus says to him, Peter, do you phileo me? Now at this point, he's actually questioning the degree to which Peter even loves Jesus. He comes down to his level. Do you phileo me? And that's when Peter says, Lord, you, you know all things. Because I want to suggest to you that Peter in his heart was totally condemned at that moment. He's wondering. And so Jesus says to him, Peter, feed my sheep. Lord, you know all things. There can be doubts in our hearts, in our minds. Because we, we see that our devotion to the Lord is far below what we think it ought to be. And we start to wonder whether or not we even are his children. Maybe I'm manifesting more of the characteristics of the children of the devil than the children of God. Peter's heart condemned him after he denied the Lord. He failed to love Jesus with self-sacrificial devotion after he had boldly proclaimed, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. He failed, he denied the Lord. But Jesus came back to him. Why? Because Jesus' relationship with Peter was not dependent upon Peter's devotion and his ability to love as Jesus loved him. And this is essentially important for you and I as we seek to walk with the Lord. And, and decades later, the same Peter who had that seaside chat with Jesus on the Sea of Galilee wrote these words in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us. He did not say, God's so great, according to my devotion and my great efforts, he's made me his child. God the Father, according to his abundant mercy, his love for me. He made me his child. He's begotten us. He's begotten us again to a living hope. My hope to be with God for eternity in heaven is not dependent upon my ability to live perfectly for God. It's dependent upon what he did according to his mercy and his grace for me. He has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 1 Peter chapter 3 or chapter 1 verse 4. To an inheritance an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled. It does not fade away reserved for you in heaven who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. And in this, 1 Peter 1.6, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you are grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to the praise, honor, and glory of Jesus Christ at his revelation, whom having not seen you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory, receiving in the end of your faith the salvation of your souls. How do you move from denier, self-condemned, to confident with that kind of confidence? It is not according to your own works. 
but according to his grace. And so back to 1 John 3. We can live with this kind of confidence to the point that John says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. So how can we live in a place where we are not condemned in the heart as it relates to our relationship with God? We recognize what the gospel has to say for us, that our relationship with God is not because we have been so devoted to God, but because He has been so devoted to us. It's not because of what we have sacrificed for God, but for what He has sacrificed for us. And so we can live in a place without this condemnation, as Paul would write in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. Point number four on your outline, my standing as God's child gives me confidence to come to Him without reservation. As a child of God, I can come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy and grace in my time of need. There's no hesitation because I'm his child. I'm his son. You're his son. You're his daughter. We have the ability in Christ to come before him at any time. And we don't have to go through the catalog of, have I been really good this week? Did I read enough chapters in the Bible this week? Did I give enough? Did I serve enough? We don't have to go through all of those things to try and come before God because Christ has made the way open for us according to his mercy. And so my standing as his child gives me confidence to come to him without reservation. And verse 22, 1 John chapter 3, whatever we ask, we receive from him. Now there's so much in that that we will save that till we get to another passage in 1 John chapter 5 in about eight years. Um, But there's another passage there that deals with this, so we'll dig deep into it. Can't do that today. But he says, whatever you ask, we receive from him. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now, does that mean that we receive good things from God because we do good things as if we merit it? No, it's all according to grace. So what is this? Well, John Stott, again, he says, obedience is the indispensable condition, not the meritorious cause of answered prayer. So God, he heaps blessing upon his children as they walk out obedience to him. To his commands. Well, what commands? Well, look at what he says. And this is the command. 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. This is the command that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave commandment. So his command is, is this. Trust in the Lord and love one another. Now, he who keeps these commands, verse 24 abides in him. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 15, abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit apart from the vine. Neither can you if you do not abide in me. So we need to abide in Christ and the Christian is encouraged to abide in Christ. What what does it mean to abide in Christ? Well, we trust in Christ and we love one another and we abide in him and as we abide in him, he abides in us, verse 24, and by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given to us. His spirit in us proves to us that we are abiding. Point number five, my place with God is on the basis of my faith as evidenced by my love. Religion says my place with God is on the basis of my hard work and good efforts. Christianity says my place, my standing with God is on the basis of my faith as evidenced by my love. My trust in Christ has given to me access to God and he has placed his spirit in me and the spirit of God produces love in us. And all of this is according to the great love of God, his love demonstrated for us. And this is why it's so important, so central to the Christian faith that we hold before us continually the reality of the love of God. Because it is all according to the love of God as demonstrated in Jesus on the cross that we have this access, that we have this assurance, that we have this place and standing with God God, and our dependence, our trust upon Him and His finished work. So this is why Jesus on that night that Peter said, though all are made to stumble, I will not stumble. I will never deny you. I would die with you. And all the other disciples, they all said that on that night, it was why on that night that Jesus took bread and he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And he took the cup. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant, my blood that is shed for you, shed for many for the remission of sins. And so 
I'm going to invite our worship leaders to come back up this morning, and we're going to partake of communion, where we, we take this little piece of bread that is a reminder of Jesus' body broken for us, and we take this little cup of juice so that we would remember his blood shed for us because there is no removal of sin apart from Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, apart from his blood shed for us. And all of this was to demonstrate God's love for you, for me, his grace towards us. And so, Father, I'm so grateful that we can have in you assurance. We can have peace, rest. Lord, we can have fullness of joy because of what your love has accomplished for us. And so, God, I pray this morning that you would help us to have that picture of your grace, your love at the forefront of our minds. And Lord, that you would prepare our hearts now by your spirit for this time of communion. Lord, we are so thankful that you who knew no sin became sin for us, that we could receive righteousness, that we could receive your love and your grace, that we could be called your sons and daughters. God, help us to rejoice in that today, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Our worship leaders are going to lead us in a song. Would you just hold on to the bread and the cup and we'll partake together in just a few minutes?